All right, how are we doing? Hello, happy Saturday. Thank you, Tara, for the host. Thank you, Rudy, for the host. And hello, Rula Pena, how are you? Hope you guys are doing good today. Hope you're having a good Saturday or weekend or whatever day or time it happens to be where you at. I hope it's all good. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here. Today we will be finishing the book. We've got seven chapters. And it's eh, about 60 pages. So we'll do 60 pages of reading and call it a night. <clears throat> All right. Um, let me drink a little water. 60 pages of greatness. Thank you. Nancy Drew books are pretty great. Hollow Riddy with the dabbing Evie. <clears throat> Y'all let me know how the music is, um, as always. Just yell at me if it's not good. Oh, thanks. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So the last thing to, to recap is Nancy went over to Joy Trent's house, and they went into, um, like, a room. Which room did they go into? The father's study, Joy's father's study, 
and Nancy started looking around and she said she thinks she found part of the answer. And that's where the cliffhanger stopped. I yell cause it seems good! Okay. <laughs> okay. Chapter 14. A Chapter 14. <laughs> Off to a great start. A trail of clues. What is it, Nancy? Said Joy, flashing her an eager look. What have you found? Her own eyes followed the direction of Nancy's gaze. The young detective was staring at a wall painting of a Civil War battle scene. It showed a line of blue-coated Union soldiers charging into the smoke and gunfire of a Confederate redoubt. Look there, Joy! Nancy pointed at two of the figures in the painting. One, the Union color sergeant, had evidently just been hit by an enemy bullet. As he fell, a companion was snatching the flag from the dying sergeant's hand. Look at what? Joy's face took on a puzzled frown. I mean, I see what you're pointing at, but so what? That's an American flag, Old Glory. Yes, of course, but... Joy's voice trailed off uncertainly, and she still looked puzzled. The flag was rather small in the picture, and its bright stars and stripes were dimmed by the gun smoke, so that it did not readily strike the eye at first glance. Nancy realized that she must have noticed it the first time she inspected the room, even though the impression had merely glimmered at the back of her mind and she had been unable to bring it into clear focus. But now the flag's significance seemed obvious. Notice where the flagstaff is pointing. As she spoke, Nancy's finger traced an invisible line from the spear point at the tip of the flagstaff across the painted canvas and out beyond the edge of the picture frame. The line pointed straight toward a single iris in a slender glass vase standing on a shelf close by. Oh! Joy caught her breath with excitement as she realized what Nancy was getting at. Iris and old glory, just like in that riddle in Dad's letter. And you did tell me, didn't you, that all the fresh irises in your house are replaced daily by your father's standing order? Yes, that's right, so this must be what his riddle referred to, because he knew there'd always be an iris in that vase for the flag to point at. Nancy nodded thoughtfully. It certainly seems like more than a coincidence, she mused aloud, but we still don't know what the question mark in the riddle stands for. She was silent for several moments, then turned to her red-haired friend. Those words, Iris and Old Glory, what do they suggest to you, Joy? Anything at all? Joy wrinkled her forehead and shrugged. Not really. Well, wait a minute, they do remind me of something. Such as, Nancy inquired keenly. That carousel horse I told you about. When Daddy first bought him for me as a birthday present, I named him Glory because he was so beautiful. And sometimes in those days when I'd talk about him, I'd refer to him as Old Glory. Joy flashed a rueful smile. But I guess that doesn't help much, does it? Hmm, you never know. You said you lent your horse to the River Heights Daycare Center? <clears throat> That's right, would you like to see it? Very much, declared Nancy. Let's drive over there now, Joy. Okay, suits me. The daycare center was located in a big old house not far from Riverside Park in what had once been a neighborhood of aristocratic mansions. Two other houses in the same block were now empty and according to a builder's sign were soon to be torn down to make way for an elevated parking garage, leaving the center as the only occupied site. Its grounds were overgrown with shrubbery and shaded by tall ancient oaks and hemlocks. Despite these rather gloomy surroundings, however, the house itself had a cheerful air and bustled with the sounds and laughter of children at play. It was staffed by volunteer members, one of whom, a Miss Blandish, gre greeted the two visitors cordially. The children are just about to have their afternoon nap, she informed Joy, so you and Nancy will be able to look over your hobby horse undisturbed. The horse stood in a big mullioned window in what had once been evidently the mansion's game room. With its raised, prancing foreleg, arched neck, and flying mane, the carousel steed looked incredibly lifelike. Its flaring pink nostrils, fiery eyes, and glossy dapple gray coat all added to the vivid impression, and its feathered bridle and gilded trappings made it seem to make it a truly royal charger. Oh, how beautiful, Nancy murmured softly, gazing at the horse in wide-eyed admiration. Now you can see why I fell in love with him when I was a little girl, said Joy, obviously pleased by her reaction. Would you like to ride him? Nancy giggled. Is anyone watching? What's the diff? Go on! Nancy, who was wearing jeans, put one foot in a stirrup and swung herself gracefully into the saddle. As she began to post up and down on the spring-mounted hobby horse, the mu music box mechanism of in the stand tinkled out a gay, lively rendition of Yankee Doodle. This is great, Nancy exclaimed. 
Joy watched merrily. <clears throat> Something tells me you're an expert horsewoman, Nancy. I've ridden in a few shows. Chuckling, she added, if I had a horse like Glory at home, I'd probably have no time for detective. Detecting. The ride and the tune ended with both girls convulsed in a fit of laughter as Nancy dismounted. Even while galloping to the music, she had been aware of some of the fine details of the horse's carving, and now that she was out of the saddle and on her feet again, she could appreciate the workmanship even more. You know, Joy, she mused with one finger to her lips as she gazed at the lovely steed. Glory is not one of the original carousel horses. It's carved in a much more realistic and lifelike style. Well, I always knew it was more beautiful than the other house horses on the merry-go-round, Joy said proudly. But I'm not sure I ever noticed it was of different workmanship. Why? Does that have some connection with Daddy's riddle? Not necessarily, but it does mean the carousel operator lied to me for some reason. Nancy explained how Leo Novak had told her the lead horse had been replaced twice, once when Joy's father had bought Glory, and again when the replacement horse was damaged by a park truck. But if Glory, too, was not one of the original carousel steeds, then the lead horse must have been replaced three times. Another thought intrigued and excited Nancy. When Fingers Malone and Baldy Krebs were sneakily examining the carousel horses on Monday night after the park closed, could Glory have been the one they were looking for? Also, the burglars who broke into the Trent's house had taken nothing. Was this because the arrival of the police car had scared them off, or could it have been that they were looking for Joy's carousel horse, but failed to find it because it was at the daycare center? Nancy realized that if her theorizing was right, then Glory must be valuable for some reason. But why? Nancy was still deep in thought as she and Joy walked away down the flagstone path leading from the old house to the street, so deeply absorbed, in fact, that she stumbled and almost fell. Oh, Nancy, dear, cried Joy, catching her friend by the arm. Are you all right? Yes, thanks, I just stubbed my toe, Nancy said ruefully. Looking down, she saw that one of the ancient flags had tilted unevenly, so that a corner of it protruded above the ground, and this was what had caught her foot. A startled expression came over Nancy's face as another exciting hunch flashed through her mind. Joy, I just thought of something, she cried. Let's go back to your house right away. As they drove through the afternoon traffic, Joy listened eagerly to Nancy's idea. Are you aware, the girl sleuth inquired, that the flower called Iris also has another name? Joy nodded. Of course, some people call them flags. As she uttered the last word, Joy caught on with a smile to Nancy's trend of thought. Oh, is that what gave you your sudden inspiration when you stumbled back there? Right. And, by the way, have you ever had algebra in school, Joy? Yes, though I must admit I'm no genius at math. Why? Because if you think of your father's message as a mathematical equation, it makes sense. Joy wrinkled her forehead. I'm not sure I follow. Well, maybe I should have said it makes sense if you substitute the word flag for the question mark, because old glory is also a flag. Nancy explained. In other words, the message would then read, Iris equals flag equals old glory. Of course, I get that now, Joy exclaimed. Nancy, how brilliant of you. So a flag must be the answer to Daddy's riddle? Exactly, and I suspect the place to look for whatever flag he's referring to is right there in his study. Minutes later, the two girls were hurrying into John Trent's study. Almost at once, Nancy's attention fastened, it, fastened on a metal statuette. It portrayed an old-time western cavalryman of Indian fighting days. He was mounted on horseback and carrying a banner in one hand. The statuette, Nancy noticed, was a bronze casting, but evidently the banner had been separately crafted. Its slender staff, which though rigid was not much thicker than a stout wire, passed through an opening in the rider's hand. Its lower end fitted into a socket on his saddle. Nancy cautiously fingered the flagstaff. Despite its snug fit, she noticed it could be jiggled slightly. Oh, Joy gasped, looking on in wide-eyed suspense. Do you think that's the flag Daddy meant? We'll soon find out, Nancy prophesied. She tugged on the flagstaff, pulling it upward through the hole in the rider's hand. As the staff came loose from its saddle socket, something else came out with it. Joy snatched the object up excitedly. It was a tiny wad of fine tissue paper. Both girls held their breath as Joy uncrumpled and smoothed out the tissue. It bore a crude drawing of a horse with a frog riding on its back. The end of chapter 14 with scurry music. Let me catch up. <laughs> what an odd time for that chapter title. You reading a book? I am reading a book. No, you're not dumb. It's not a, a typical sort of stream situation. 
Imagine all the kids having fun enjoying an elevated parking garage. Hey, Stuart. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh... So, my bit badges are koalas on dollars. Thanks to Riddy. Riddy made me koala dollars. So, yep. I hit a wall at 6 p.m. and I've been shattered. Yeah, you need to get some sleep. Thank you for the claps. There's no such thing as sleeping too much. Actually, there is. I'm not a doctor, but... <laughs> I am a koala. <laughs> I was just confused. It's okay. Opie ope. Okay. Shall we move along? <clears throat> I am doing well. I hope you are too. Chapter 15. The Yesterday Message. Another riddle? Joy exclaimed. What on earth does it mean? A frog on a horse, Nancy murmured pensively. Then she shook her head. I'm afraid I don't know either, Joy, but the drawing must mean something or your father wouldn't have left it here for you to find. I'm sure we can decipher it if we put our heads together and think hard enough. In the meantime, the statuette itself, the bronze likeness of a western cavalryman, had started a brand new train of thought in Nancy's mind. There's another lead on the carousel mystery I want to check out this afternoon, Joy, she went on. I'll let you know as soon as I have anything to report. From the Trent's house, Nancy drove to the River Heights Public Library. There she looked up the name Walter Cruz in the catalog file. Several books were listed about the famous western artist and his work, and Nancy was able to find one of them on the shelves. It was entitled The Art of Walter Cruz. She took her find to a table near the window and began leafing through its pages. As she studied the reproductions in color of Cruz's paintings and sculptures, Nancy grew more and more excited. So my hunch was right, she murmured under her breath. Now I'm sure of it. After returning the book to its place on the shelf, Nancy went to the pay telephone in the library's front lobby and called the director of the River Heights Art Museum, who was an old friend. They spoke for several minutes. Then she hung up and called reporter Rick Jason at the news. Hey, Nancy, he said. How are you coming on the carousel mystery? I think I'm getting close to a solution, but I'll need your help. Would you do me a favor? Just name it. Nancy told him about Joy Trent's carousel horse at the daycare center and asked if he could arrange to have a picture story about it appear in the evening paper. I know it's late to be asking, she added apologetically, but this is really important. It may pay off in quite a new scoop if I do succeed in solving this mystery. Okay, we're almost ready to go to press, so we may have to remake a couple of pages to fit it in, but i that's no great problem. I'll talk to the editor and get a photographer on the job pronto. Another thing, Nancy went on hastily, could your editor possibly use his influence with the television news people to get a similar story broadcast on tonight's news? You know about how a horse from the haunted carousel has turned up at the local daycare center? One can but try, Rick Jason replied. If I pass the word that it may help Nancy Drew solve the carousel mystery, I think they'll probably go along. But remember, I get the scoop. The teenage sleuth chuckled. That's a promise, and thanks a million for your help. Hanging up, Nancy hurried out of the library to her car and headed for Bess Marvin's house. Bess told her that Ned Nickerson had been trying to reach her. Okay, thanks, Bess. I'll call him, Nancy responded. But first, how would you like to help me out on a little detective work at the park? Bess's blue eyes lit up with su suppressed excitement. Need you ask? I mean, while well, providing it's not too dangerous. Nancy dimpled. Don't worry. No more crook chases, at least not if I can help it. She explained hastily what she had in mind. Then she called Ned and arranged to meet him at Riverside Park. Moments later, the two girls were whizzing there in Nancy's trim blue sports car. On arriving, Nancy stayed behind in the car, according to their prearranged plan, while Bess made her way on foot to the carousel. There she stopped and began watching the merry-go-round revolve gaily with its riders as if she were waiting for someone. Every few minutes, she would walk about restlessly and take up a new position just to make sure the operator noticed her. Leo Novak had seen Bess Marvin before and soon recognized her as Nancy Drew's chum. Waiting for your friend? He asked presently. Yes, for Nancy Drew. Bess pretended to be in a chatty mood and began boasting about Nancy's many successes as a sleuth. Incidentally, I guess you won't have to worry anymore about your carousel being haunted. Oh no? Novak tilted an eyebrow. How come? 
Well, this is off the record, you understand, but Nancy told me she found a hobby horse at the River Heights Daycare Center, which originally came off your Wonderland gallop. Is that so? One of Mr. Ogden's old carousel horses, huh? Novak's expression took on a shrewd frown as he added, What's that got to do with the haunting, though? Bess shrugged her plump shoulders. Search me, but that's what Nancy told me. I believe she thinks that whoever was playing such a prank on you was really searching for that horse. And now that it's turned up, the prank won't be necessary anymore. If there's no more haunting, she says, that'll prove her theory's correct. Hmm. Novak grunted in a way that sounded as if he was not convinced. Sounds pretty far out to me. Several minutes later, Nancy came walking toward the merry-go-round to join Bess. On seeing Nancy, the carousel operator said, Your girlfriend's been telling me you've figured out why my carousel plays at night. Nancy smiled politely. Well, let's say I have a theory about it. She also claims there won't be any more of this, uh, spooky business. Only if my theory's right. Leo Novak continued to ply Nancy with questions, obviously fishing for information, but she fended them off with a few teasing remarks. Then Nancy turned to her chum. Come on, Bess, it's past five. We better be getting back to the car. As the two girls walked off, Novak stared after them with an irritated look of frustration. Ned Nickerson was waiting beside Nancy's blue sports car when she and Bess reached the parking lot. Still hard at work on the mystery trail? Nancy grinned back at her boyfriend. Just testing a theory, you might say. Care to come on an errand with me? Sure, whereabouts? The Regent Hotel, but I promised Bess I'd drive her home first. Ned followed the girls in his own car. Then after going to her own house and parking in the driveway, Nancy slid in beside him. On their way to the hotel, she related the strange way in which the mystery woman, Miss Rose Harrod, had sent an iris to Joy Trent. I want to let her know that Joy Trent intends to get in touch with her, Nancy ended. The Regent Hotel, though rather small and old-fashioned in its decor, was one of the most exclusive hotels in River Heights. Nancy's fir Nancy first tried to call Miss Harrod's room on one of the house phones in the lobby, but no one answered, so she sought help from the desk clerk. Would you happen to know by any chance where Miss Harrod has gone, or how soon she'll be back? I couldn't say, miss, but let me check her room slot. The clerk turned to the honeycomb of numbered cubby holes behind the marble-topped counter. Well, her room key's here, so she's evidently out somewhere. Let's see what her, the, this note says. He glanced at the slip of paper that he pulled out of the 922 cubby hole. Hmm, that's odd, he murmured and handed it to Nancy. The paper was the kind of form slip on which clerks jotted down messages to or from the hotel guests. It said, Time, 5.45 p.m. Message, if Nancy Drew or Joy Trent phones or comes to the hotel, please tell them I had to go out to the airport, but will be back shortly. Mrs. Harrod. Nancy looked up and saw the puzzled expression on the desk clerk's face. Is something wrong? I'm not sure. He scratched his head uncertainly and turned to glance up at the wall clock overhead. It's now going on six and I've been on duty for the past few hours, but I know I didn't write that message. So it must have been left in the slot yesterday? Nancy caught her breath anxiously. Then you... You mean Mrs. Harrod's been missing for the past 24 hours? End of chapter 15. New train of thought. Choo-choo! Then Nickerson had been trying to reach him. Cut to Ned reaching his hand out the front door. Reach her. Wusp! Nancy got some ghost be gone spray, so you're fine. I know. <laughs> Thank you for the claps. I need to uh, go check something really quick, but I will be right back. I'll leave you with some music. Don't go anywhere. I'm sorry for the break. I'll be right back.
Oh, of course this starts right when I come back. I love Shadow Ranch, but I swear those banjo tunes get so annoying. <laughs> Hi, Diamond. Good to see you again. I'm back. I got worried because... I got worried because uh, I when I stepped away from my uh, computer and I was walking downstairs all of, like our whole like all of our electricity flickered and I was like oh shoot I just lost my stream like I know I did like or it just you know stopped and I'm gonna have to restart it but then I came back up here and everything was still going and so I don't know if my internet somehow didn't flicker and it was just the lights but I don't know the band just kept it alive something happened I don't know but yay it didn't get interrupted, so that's good. All right, all right. Good to see you, Timon. Okay, we've got five more chapters to read. I'm going to keep it going. Okay, chapter 16, Kidnap Car. Well, I don't know if missing is the right word, the clerk replied cautiously, but it does seem as though she hasn't returned to the hotel. Seeing Nancy's dismayed look, he went on. Tell you what, the relief clerk, the one who must have taken down that message, will be coming on duty shortly. He could tell you more about it than I could. The desk clerk smiled reassuringly. Yes, of course. I'll wait for him, Nancy said, realizing nothing could be done until then. She went and sat next to Ned on a sofa amid the lobby's potted plants and tried to curb her impatience. Finally, after ten long minutes, a dark-haired young man walked behind the counter, buttoning his uniform jacket. As Nancy rose and walked to the desk, she kept her fingers crossed. It turned out she was in luck. The young man had a good memory. Sure, I remember writing down that message, he recalled. Mrs. Harrod dictated it to me. Some man had called her just a couple of minutes before. Did the caller leave his name? Nancy inquired. No, but he'd rung a room and gotten no answer, so his call was switched here to the desk. It was about that girl whose name is on the message, Joy Trent. The clerk pointed to the slip of paper on the marble counter. Do you mind telling me what that caller wanted? No, he said that if Mrs. Harrod wanted some information about this Joy Trent, she should meet him at the airport coffee shop, and that he'd wait for her there exactly one hour, and she should look for a man with a mustache and a cane. The desk clerk went on to relate that just as he had hung up from taking this call, Mrs. Harrod herself had come walking into the lobby. I told her what the man had said, and it seemed to make her very happy. That's when she dictated this message to me, and I stuck it in her room slot as a reminder. Then she turned right around and left the hotel again. Since a room key's still here, I guess she never came back. Thanks ever so much for your help. Nancy smiled at the desk clerk, trying not to show her worry. Then she went back to the sofa to tell Ned what she had learned. We'd better get out to the airport, said Ned. Nancy nodded, and they hurried outside to his car. <clears throat> the airport was not far from River Heights, but in the rush hour traffic, the going seemed agonizingly slow. After Ned had parked his car in the airport lot, the two young people quickly made their way to the coffee shop inside the air terminal. There was a serving counter and small tables grouped around the shop's glass window walls. Aside from a middle-aged woman nibbling a sandwich at one of the tables, the place was empty. As Nancy and Ned hesitated uncertainly, a smiling, kindly-looking woman in a waitress uniform emerged from the kitchen. <clears throat> she was carrying some boxes which she put under the counter. Can I help you people? In response, Nancy described Rose Harrod in the time when she had presumably come to the coffee shop yesterday. The waitress nodded promptly with a look of interest. Yes, I remember her. It was almost quiet as today. She came in and looked around and went right to that table over there. The waitress pointed. Some guy was sitting there. Must have been waiting for her, I guess. Anyhow, he ordered fresh coffee for himself and a cup for her and they began talking. This man she met, Nancy said. Could you describe him? Yeah, he was kind of a skinny old guy. He had mustache and glasses and a hook nose. Oh, and I remember he had a cane. Please go on. Well, the next time I looked over that way, the lady had her elbows on the table and she was holding her head in her hands. She looked really sick. Nancy exchanged a startled glass with, glance with Ned, who asked the waitress, sick enough to need medical attention? She sure looked that way to me. The old guy threw some bills on the table and they left. She was so wobbly he had to help her walk. Did anyone send for an ambulance? Nancy inquired. No, I could see right out through the glass. A big fat guy with, a long, with long blonde hair and a beard came up and offered to help. He was holding the lady on one side. I ran out to give the old man his change and asked if I could call the doctor for her. 
Well, what did he say? He said he was a doctor himself and he'd take her out for some fresh air. The waitress shrugged. So they walked out of the building and that's the last I saw of them. How come you're looking for her, dear? Was this lady a relative of yours? No, just a, a friend, but she never returned to her hotel, so I'm quite worried. The waitress clucked sympathetically. Nancy thanked her for the information and went back out to the parking lot with Ned. I hate to say this, Nancy, but it sounds a lot like Mrs. Harrod was drugged, Ned commented. That's just what I'm afraid of. That man she met could easily have slipped something into her coffee. Nancy shaded her eyes as she gazed at the row of parked cars. Ned, Rose Harrod's car was a silver two-door sedan. I don't know what make, but I'm sure I'll recognize it. Let's see if it's still in the lot. After several minutes of searching, Nancy sighed. Wow, I never realized it before, but silver has got to be the most popular car color. Let's talk to the parking lot attendant, Na Ned suggested. Yes, maybe he'll remember, Nancy said. Let's just hope he was on duty this time yesterday. The attendant was reading a newspaper in his booth. He was a chubby man, about 50 years old, and he was a retired policeman. When Nancy asked him about Mrs. Harrod, he immediately recalled seeing the two men bring her into the lot from the air terminal the day before. Reason I remember is, she drove in here a nice looking silver car and then 10 or 15 minutes later she comes back out with two guys having to hold her up on her feet and then she leaves in their car instead of her own of course i could see she'd been taken ill but even so it seemed kind of odd did you talk to them at all well when they drove up to pay me i asked her if everything was okay at least i tried to i mean about leaving her car here and all she was so too sick and woozy to give me a straight answer but the old guy with glasses and a mustache said he was a doctor and he was taking her to the hospital Nancy said, do you remember what kind of car he was driving? Yeah, a beat up old black station wagon. That seemed funny too, because I figured a doctor would be driving a better car than that. So I even wrote down the license number just in case. I got it right here. Good for you. Nancy jotted down the information which the parking lot attendant supplied, then thanked him and hurried to the nearest public telephone with Ned. Nancy called police chief McGinnis and gave him the description and license number of the station wagon. She asked if he could trace its registration and have all police cars keep a lookout for it. Will do, Nancy. I'll call as soon as I have anything, Chief McGinnis promised. After hanging up, Nancy said, Well, would you like to come to dinner with me, Ned? There's nothing more we could do for the time being, and I'm sure you must be as hungry as I am. Sounds good to me, Ned replied with a grin. Soon they were on their way to the Drew's house. Hannah Gruen was just about to serve dinner. The motherly housekeeper set another place for Ned, and the two young people joined her and Mr. Drew at the table. Nancy had just finished her shrimp cocktail when the telephone rang. She immediately jumped up, saying, That could be for me. I'll get it. Nancy? said the caller's voice when she picked up. Chief McGinnis here. Sorry if this is your dinner hour, but I thought you'd want to know immediately. That station wagon was reported stolen yesterday. It was found abandoned early this morning out near Fishwick. I hope this helps you. It does, Chief. Thank you for letting me know so promptly. Hanging up, Nancy returned quickly to the dining room. Ned, they found that station wagon out near Fishwick this morning. I'm going out there now. Do you want to come? Sure thing. Please excuse me, Mrs. Gruen. Mr. Drew? He rose from the table. Nancy hastily apologized for interrupting the meal. Dad, Hannah, I'll explain it all when we get back. It's really urgent. I'm sorry. Please go on with your dinner. We'll get something later on while we're out. Nancy kissed her father, gave Hannah a hug, and whirled out of the room, followed by Ned. It was not yet 8 p.m. and still light out. Fortunately, traffic was sparse, and Nancy drove as fast as the speed limit allowed down down to the river road, then out along the two-lane country road that led to Fishwick. I feel I just can't get there fast enough, Ned, Nancy murmured anxiously. What do you think happened to her? I don't know. Maybe we should have checked the hospitals first. You're right. If this turns out to be a fruitless trip, that's the next thing we'll do. Fishwick was a seedy beach community strung out along the riverbank. It centered on a cafe, a gas station, and general store, and a boating pier. A row of run-down looking cottages completed the picture. After slowing to look around, Nancy pulled into the gas station. A leathery-faced man got up off his tilted back chair. What'll it be, gas or bait? Neither, Nancy smiled at him. You look like a very observant man. The man responded with a pleased grin and shrewd wink. Ain't much goes on around here, but gets by me. Why, you looking for someone? Yes, a sick woman. Two men brought her out here late yesterday in an old black station wagon. Did you happen to notice them? Yep, that's the place. He pointed to a cottage half hidden among some trees. Do you know who lives there? Shucks, can't keep track. These places are rented by the day or, or the week. Nancy thanked him and drove on with Ned to the cottage. When they knocked, no one answered, but suddenly a faint moan reached their ears. Ned, did you hear that? Nancy exclaimed. You bet I did. 
Her friend put his husky shoulder to the door and pushed hard. The cheap lock soon gave way and the door flew open. Nancy gasped at the sight that met her eyes. On a bare cot lay Rose Herod, tied and gagged. End of chapter 16. This music's a bit cheery for tied and gagged Mrs. Herod. Let's see. Let me catch up. Keep on keeping on. Will do. Haunted, haunted carousel stream. Reading stream of book number 72 of a series I've never read all the way. Oh, I'm reading these out of order because they're standalone books. So don't worry about it too much. Hello, Paige. You can make up backstories, yeah. Thank you for shouting out, Paige. Waiting for a doggy to eat his foodie. We're pretty far in. We're, we've got like four chapters left now. I like how V looks away from the book as if she's reading to a crowd, but here the crowd is dispersed over thousands of miles. Yeah, I know, but I want you guys to feel like I'm reading to you and not just like, you know. Oh, wow, I've missed a lot. Well, welcome home from work. I hope work was good. She was hogtied. <laughs> you clasps. Claps and clasps. That's a weird word. Clasps. Clasps. Now that I'm saying that, it sounds really weird. Clasps. Clasps. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm so glad you feel very red, too. That's the goal. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> we gonna keep going. <clears throat> Trying not to cough. Okay. Chapter 17. Double stakeout. Nancy rushed to undo the woman's gag. Mrs. Herod, she exclaimed, are you all right? The woman's eyes flickered open, but they scarcely seemed to focus, and the only audible response was a few faint mumbled words. I... I don't know. Where am I? Before Nancy could reply, Rose Herod's eyes rolled upward and her lids drooped shut again. She was obviously dazed and disoriented. She must un still be under the effects of the drug that fellow gave her, Ned declared grimly. But Nancy shook her head. I doubt if whatever he slipped in her coffee would keep her under this long... More likely they've sedated her again after they brought her here to the cottage. The cottage, though barely furnished, at least had electricity and running water. Ned switched on the overhead light since dusk was gathering fast outside and untied the ropes binding Mrs. Herod. Meanwhile, Nancy wrung out her handkerchief in cold water. Together, they raised Rose Herod to a sitting position and managed to revive her, but she was able to stammer only a few confused words about the kidnapping before slumping unconscious again. We'd better get her to a doctor right away, Ned decided. Yes, the sooner the better, Nancy agreed. I'll help you carry her out to the car. No problem, I could carry her. Ned, a well-muscled six-footer, <laughs> easily gathered the woman up in his arms, and minutes later they were speeding back to town. After they had delivered Mrs. Herod to the emergency room of the River Heights Hospital, Nancy called police headquarters to report what had happened. By the time she hung up, the intern on duty had finished examining the patient. She's been drugged all right, he told Nancy and Ned, but I don't think there'll be any permanent ill effects. In any case, I'd like to keep her here under observation at least overnight. The two young people went to a nearby restaurant to settle down at last to their delayed dinner, but both were still too keyed up over the events of the evening to eat very much. Moreover, Nancy was already laying plans for her night's detective work. Will you help me, Ned? she asked. When he eagerly agreed, Nancy explained what she had in mind. Then she made several calls from a pay telephone in the restroom. She succeeded in contacting reporter Rick Jason, George's friend Neil Sawyer, the electrical engineering student, and the park policeman Officer Doyle, who had by now gone off duty. All three promised to meet her shortly before 11 p.m. at the same wooded stakeout spot where she and Ned had kept watch on the carousel on Monday night. It was long past 9.30 when Nancy and Ned finally left the restaurant. They drove first to police headquarters where Nancy borrowed a pair of police walkie-talkie radios. Then they drove on to the Trent's house. Nancy had already called Joy from the restaurant and learned that she had a key to the daycare center since Joy did volunteer work there in addition to lending her carousel horse for the children's enjoyment. Ned waited in the car while Nancy went up to ring the bell. Joy herself answered the door and handed Nancy the key. Something tells me you have an exciting evening ahead, she said enviously. The young sleuth chuckled and held up crossed fingers. I just hope it doesn't get too exciting for my health. 
After leaving Joy's house, Nancy and Ned headed for the daycare center. They parked well out of sight of their destination and walked the rest of the way. At this late hour, the whole surrounding neighborhood lay dark and silent. The only sounds were an occasional faint echo of traffic from Riverside Avenue, which bordered the park several blocks away. Nancy and Ned found a shadowy spot among the tall pines and hemlocks and bushes from which they could keep watch unseen on the big old house. During dinner, they had found time to glance at the photo story on the center's carousel horse, which had appeared in the evening paper. You think that'll be enough to attract the same burglars who broke into Joy Trent's house? Ned inquired softly. That or the television news bit, I hope, Nancy replied, assuming my hunch is right, of course. As the hands of her wristwatch crept around toward 11 o'clock, Nancy finally left Ned to keep watch alone while she went to check with her three cohorts outside the amusement park. Rick Jason, Neil Sawyer, and Officer Doyle were all waiting at the agreed-upon spot just outside the park's pipe and chain barrier as Nancy came walking along the dark footpath to join them. Rick Jason was in high spirits at the prospect of a possible news scoop. So this is how the famous girl detective gets her man, eh? He bantered. Nancy's blue eyes twinkled in the moonlight. That remains to be seen. Minutes later, the midway lights were turned off and the amusement park area gradually settled down to stillness and darkness. At last, Neil Sawyer legged over the pipe chain barrier and made his way cautiously toward the carousel. When he returned, he was grinning broadly. Did my ploy work? Nancy inquired. You bet, there's a radio relay switch attached to the control box just like I described to you. He reported with a triumphant look. Marvelous, Nancy grinned back. George certainly recommended the right technical expert. After a hasty final discussion with Neil Rick and Officer Doyle, Nancy left the park and returned to Ned at their spy post outside the daycare center. Any developments, Ned? Nothing so far. I just wish we'd brought something comfortable to sit on. Nancy giggled softly. Never mind. At least there's enough grass and undergrowth to keep the pine needles from pricking us. She leaned against her friend's shoulder, and Ned slipped his arm around her waist. Twenty minutes went by as pleasantly, tw twenty minutes went by pleasantly as they chatted under their breath and enjoyed each other's company. Suddenly, there was a crackle of radio static, and Officer Doyle's voice came over Nancy's walkie-talkie. The trap's been sprung. End of chapter seventeen. I've just noticed I've been orange the entire time I show up here, even after like a hiatus of a, like a year or something. Some lady was losing her you-know-what over a wallet she thought was lost, but she dropped in the entry. <laughs> Library drama. Thankfully she left on a stretcher. She found her wallet and left. Well-muscled six-footer. I don't imagine Ned is six-foot. Yeah, he's like a quarterback or something. I know he plays football. I know he plays like eight positions on the football team. At least according to that one book that seemed to imply the football team with Ned was on had three players, including him. Ned is probably Storm. He feels not strong being six feet, but not able to pick up people. Tara isn't six foot and would probably drop people. I put that in my notes for the book. <laughs> There's that whole chapter describing the football game by somebody who probably never watched a football game. He's just used to carrying people as he carries his team with only a few players. <laughs> if the three people are good enough. 30 to 50 people? Oh, football is two teams of 11, yes. Yeah, American football, yeah. So a lot of people on that bench. She's Paige is clasping again. Dog music? Oh, this is Blackmore Manor music. Can anyone even describe a football game though? <laughs> I don't know if you heard that thunder. People running back and forth chasing Nachi. Oh no. It's chaos and suddenly somewhere is a touchdown. Thunder. Feel the thunder. Oh, yeah. No, because I, I, I started the playlist with um, Haunted Carousel music and they're going in order of games. Or maybe bot. <laughs> it's okay. Some, some musics sound really similar to me, so I understand. 
Okay. Um, all right, we've got three more chapters to go. Let's keep going. <clears throat> Chapter 18, Circling Shadows. So her plan had succeeded. Nancy smiled triumphantly at a grinning Ned. Nice going, beautiful, he commented. Patting his arm, Nancy murmured, I'll be back as soon as I can. Take care. With that, she hurried off to her car and drove the few blocks to the amusement park, which was now partially lit up. Grouped around the carousel were Officer Doyle, Rick Jason, Neil Sawyer, and a nervous-looking Leo Novak. Smart girl, Nancy! J Rick, J Rick Jason greeted her with a grin. Everything happened just as you predicted. The carousel suddenly started playing. That woke up the people in the trailers and the lights came on. Then Mr. Novak came running up to the carousel, Officer Doyle chimed in. It stopped playing when he was halfway to it, but he checked over the machinery. The teenage sleuth turned on Leo Novak and asked, What did you find? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The carousel owner blurted emphatically. He plowed his fingers through his dark hair with a bewildered expression on his face. I have no idea what's causing all this funny business, and I don't see any sign that the operating machinery has been tampered with. Nancy, Rick, and Officer Doyle glanced at one another. Meanwhile, Neil Sawyer quietly went over and slipped his hand under the operator's control box. Mr. Novak's right, he reported a moment later. There are no gimmicks on the controls now. In this way, he let the others know that someone had removed the radio relay he had discovered earlier that evening. Nancy nodded and flashed a barely perceptible eye signal to Le Officer Doyle. The policeman immediately turned to Leo Novak. I wonder if you'd be good enough to empty out your pockets, sir? What? Leo Novak stared indignantly. It's up to you, Mr. Novak. Empty your pockets now voluntarily, or I intend to arrest you for disturbing the peace. Disturbing the peace? The owner's face was rapidly taking on a deep crimson flush. That's right, Officer Doyle explained calmly, by running your carousel after hours. That'll mean a trip to the station house and everything else that goes with being arrested. Now wait a minute, Leo Novak began angrily. But after one look at the faces of the surrounding witnesses, he dropped his bluff and sullenly emptied his pockets. Among the sparse contents which he dumped into Do Officer Doyle's waiting hands was a little metal and plastic device with a short length of wire and a spring clip attached to the end. That's the radio relay, said Neil Sawyer. Next, something that looked like a small handheld walkie-talkie with a disappearing antenna emerged from the owner's pocket. And there's the signal transmitter, Neil added. Novak's face was livid with fury, but he knew he was trapped. Nancy turned to Rick Jason. Well, have I solved the mystery of the haunted carousel or not? Before the reporter could do more than nod, the borrowed walkie-talkie attached to Officer Doyle's belt suddenly came to life. Ned's voice, low but quivering with suppressed excitement, crackled from the speaker. Nancy, come back here fast and try to avoid being seen. Leaving the policeman to deal with Leo Novak, Nancy, with a hasty wave of her hand, turned and ran back to her car in the parking lot. In a few moments, she was driving through the dark, sleeping streets toward the daycare center. Again, parking a block or so away, she slipped out of the car and walked swiftly to Ned's hiding place among the trees and shrubbery. As she joined him, he whispered, I saw a car drive slowly around the block three times. Then it stopped around the corner, out of sight. Did anyone get out? Nancy inquired softly. Yes, I heard the car door open and shut, and I think someone's trying to get into that house right now, by the back way. As the young people strained their eyes to pierce the midnight gloom, a flickering light suddenly appeared, first in one window, then another. Someone was moving through the big old house. What now? Ned said tensely. Want me to go in after them? We'll both go, but not yet. First, we'd better make sure they didn't post a lookout. Slipping through the trees as silently as shadows, the pair circled the grounds of the daycare center and made their way cautiously toward the marauder's car. It was empty. Nancy drew a sigh of relief. Okay, no lookout. Now to see what they're up to inside. Wait a minute. Ned seized her arm. Let me go in there alone. You wait out here. Nancy pressed her lips to his cheek. Don't be silly. We'll be safer if we stay together. Before Ned could object any further, Nancy darted back toward the house. Her friend followed hastily. Hand in hand, they tiptoed up the broad front porch steps. Nancy reached in her pocket and took out the key Joy Trent had given her. She inserted it in the lock, turned it, and cautiously pushed open the big front door. It swung inward with faintly creaking hinges. Inside, all was dark. Nancy and Ned held their breath for a moment to make sure no one had heard the creaks. Then they slipped into the house and inched the door shut behind them. Having visited the daycare center many hours earlier, Nancy fortunately was able to lead the way. Groping for obstacles in the darkness, they crossed a tiled vestibule, then went down a central hall and veered off through two carpeted rooms toward what was now the nursery playroom. 
Here they paused, and with bated breath, maneuvered themselves into suitable positions from which to peek into the lighted playroom. Two men were standing near Joy's carousel horse. One was a thin, scar-faced elderly fellow in a dark business suit with glasses, mustache, and a large hooked nose. The other, who looked like an overage hippie, was big and fat with long blonde hair and a beard. They appeared to be tampering with the saddle pad of the wooden horse, trying to pry it up, first on one side, then on the other, but without success. You sure you got the instructions right? The bigger man growled at his partner. Read the letter again. The elderly, scar-faced man took a folded paper from his pocket and started to read it aloud in a low, muttering voice. Nancy, much to her vexation, was unable to catch most of the words. Meanwhile, Ned was leaning on the back of a chair while he craned to peer around the edge of the archway into the playroom. Suddenly, he felt his fingers slipping. He struggled desperately to keep his grip and his balance, but it was no use. A moment later, the chair slipped out from under him and Ned went crashing to the floor. With a snarl and an oath, the two intruders realized they were being spied on. They rushed at Ned and Nancy. The elderly mustached man grabbed Nancy by the shoulder. He pushed her back against the wall, pinning her tightly. Before Ned could scramble to his feet to help her, the burly hippie booted him down again with a hard, vicious kick. End of chapter 18. I'm oblivious to what songs go with what games. I'm so hungry I can't think. Me often. Yeah, I hope you get some dinner. We be zooming through these chapters, though. They are pretty short chapters. They're like eight pages. I think I'm gonna drive home because I'd rather not eat at my mom's house since she just had the stomach flu. Oh, okay. Be safe. Be safe driving. It just started raining outside, so if for some reason I lose internet, I'll be back as soon as it's back up. Rick James greeted her with a super frank. Super freak. She's super freaky. Um, I was told I could eat anything I wanted while house-sitting. I should probably eat all three boxes of Cap'n Crunch. This seems reasonable. <laughs> yeah, but I, what will I eat tomorrow? Everything else? <laughs> Good call. Fruito loops? Fruit loops? Just imagine hiring a house sitter and you come- sit cedar <laughs> Sitter and you come back with the food eaten. No milk. Well, surely tzatziki sauce is a good enough replacement. Not anymore, I'm not, because that'd be weird and such. I don't even know what tzatziki is. Oh, it's like the stuff you put on, like, gyros, you know? Is that better than milking any animal close by? Ned, you're so clumsy. Use your six for her muscledness. I missed Ned, I didn't see. Would you like to see the picture? Here to picture again. Ned, look at Ned being all clumsy and falling on the ground. And this guy looks like David Harbour from Stranger Things. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> Two more chapters. Whoa, did you hear the thunder? Yeah, that dude in the doorway. He looks like David Harbour, right? From Stranger Things. Here's Johnny. <laughs> Ned showing he the goofest to Nancy's gallant. I don't know what that means. It's a reference I'm sure I don't know. Or gallant. I know how to say words. <clears throat> okay. Two more chapters, let's go. <clears throat> Chapter 19, A Precious Parcel. Ned grabbed the crook's foot to keep from being kicked again. He tried to twist his ankle and topple him at the same time. The crook started to fall but managed to clutch onto the chair Ned had overturned. He swung it sideways with both hands, grazing Ned's shoulder and arm. Out of the corner of her eye, Nancy saw her boyfriend wince with pain and let go his grip on the enemy enemy's foot. At the same time, Nancy saw the distraction in her captor's eye. His grip loosened and she shoved him backward. She bolted forward, snatching up one of the small child-sized chairs in the playroom and began to swing it at her mustached assailant. With an angry oath, he backed away. Although Nancy kept him at bay, she soon found he was she was being expertly maneuvered into a corner. 
She caught a fleeting glimpse of Ned. By now, he had regained his feet and was fighting back gamely with his burly foe. But he was only using one arm, and with a sinking heart, Nancy realized it was only a matter of time before they might f both find themselves at the mercy of their ruthless attackers. Suddenly, a third man rushed into the room. At first, Nancy took it for granted that he must be an ally or partner of the other two crooks. Her hasty glance in the dim light registered that only the fact that he was stocky and gray-haired and wore a clay-covered safari jacket. Clay-colored safari jacket. She tried not to panic at the thought that with this additional help for her, their enemies, she and Ned would now be overpowered in short order. Instead, to Nancy's astonishment, the newcomer grabbed one arm of her assailant and twisted it behind his back. As he bent forward trying to wrench himself away, Nancy knocked him to the floor with a blow of the chair which she had been using as a shield. The crook groaned and went limp, too stunned to resist further. Without a word, Nancy and her rescuer turned to help Ned. His attacker grunted and gulped as the gray-haired man grabbed him around the neck. Ned seized his chance to plant his fist in the big crook's stomach. Then as the fellow crumpled, Ned laid him a hard punch on his jaw. With a cry of relief, Nancy hugged her friend. Oh, Ned, thank goodness, was all she could say for a moment. Are you all right? He asked anxiously. Nancy smiled at him. I will be when I catch my breath. Nancy had already deduced the identities of their two, two attackers, partly from their voices. Their present appearances confirmed their guest. Her guess. The burly hippie had lost his blonde wig, and his fake beard was now hanging loose. Nancy easily recognized him as Baldy Krebs. As a result of the frantic struggle, his companion's mustache and putty nose were both crooked, and the reddish fake scar had partly rubbed off his cheek when he fell to the floor. No wonder Bess didn't recognize him as Fingers Malone after I chased him into the park that day, Nancy thought. He probably put on his disguise before he came out of the haunted house. Meanwhile, Ned was shaking hands with the gray-haired man in the safari jacket. Nancy, too, started to thank him, then broke off with a gasp as she got her first good look at their rescuer. Mr. Franz, what are you doing here? She blurted out as she recognized the retired businessman and amusement park buff. Luckily, you're, you left your key in the door just now, Franz chuckled. Turning serious, he added, I must apologize for deceiving you, Miss Drew. Actually, I'm an insurance investigator, and I've been trailing these crooks ever since Fingers Malone broke out of prison. An insurance company after a crook for a prison break? N Ned looked puzzled. I don't get it. It wasn't the prison break that brought him here, Nancy deduced. I'll bet you're looking for something Fingers stole 20 years ago. Right, Mr. Franz? It was the insurance investigator's turn to look startled. Absolutely right, Miss Drew. But how did you know? Because I learned his background from a St. Louis police detective who's also in town looking for him. Arno Franz explained that he had seen and heard the news stories about the carousel horse at the daycare center, and like Nancy, has suspected this might prove an irresistible bait to the criminal he was after. Accordingly, he had come to the daycare center late at night, arriving just before Nancy and Ned entered the big old house. Franz eyed the wooden steed in perplexity. You know, I have a strong hunch that what I'm looking for may be hidden inside this thing, he mused aloud, but don't ask me exactly how or where. Nancy smiled mysteriously. I'll try to answer that question tomorrow when everyone can be here, she said, especially Joy Trent, who owns this carousel horse. In the meantime, I think we'd better let Police Chief McGinnis and Detective Norris know about these two. I'll go and phone them from the office in the next room. A police cruiser soon arrived outside the house and the two crooks were whisked off in handcuffs. Nancy was praised and congratulated for the clever way in which she had brought the manhunt to a successful conclusion, but the complete solution of the case still remained unknown. When Nancy walked into the playroom at the daycare center at 11 o'clock the following morning, accompanied by Bess and George, she found an expectant group of people seated and eagerly awaiting her revelations. Among them were Arno Franz, Police Chief McGinnis, Reporter Rick Jason, Detective Norris, a smiling Joy Trent, and her haughty Aunt Selma. Bess and George found chairs next to Ned, who had arrived a few minutes earlier in his own car. "'I'm dying of curiosity, Nancy,' Bess whispered to her friend. "'Hurry up and start explaining.' Nancy smiled and cleared her throat. <clears> throat> "'We've had a number of mysterious happenings in River Heights recently, but one way or another they all have to do with this carousel horse of Joy's, which, incidentally, happens to be extremely valuable.' Joy Trent shot a quizzical glance at the young detective. Well, glory certainly means a lot to me, Nancy, she said, but you mean he's valuable for some other reason, too? Very much so. He was carved by a famous Western artist named Walter Cruz, and the director of the River Heights Art Museum estimates that your horse may be worth a great deal. 
Thousands of dollars, in fact. Joy's eyes widened, and the audience gasped at Nancy's announcement. The teenage detective explained that horses had been one of Cruz's favorite subjects as both a painter and a sculptor, and that she had easily identified his style after consulting the library book that contained pictures of his work. When Cruz carved this horse, Nancy went on, he was an unknown artist. At the time, he was working as a carny roustabout at the same amusement park in St. Louis where the Wonderland Gallop was located at the time. The lead horse on the carousel was damaged by a truck. So, as a favor to his girlfriend's father, who then owned the merry-go-round, Walter Cruz carved a replacement horse. No wonder it's so beautiful, Bess murmured. Nancy related that Leo Novak was only an employee of the owner, Mr. Ogden, when the horse was carved. Later, Ogden moved the carousel to River Heights, but after several years, he took it back to the same amusement park in St. Louis. On Ogden's death, Novak took over the Wonderland Gallop. Then, last winter, Nancy went on, Novak read a newspaper story about the late artist Walter Cruz and how his work was now bringing record prices in New York art galleries. He suddenly realized that this was the same Walter Cruz who had carved the replacement horse for the carousel, which Ogden had sold to Joy's father. And if he could get it back, it might be worth a small fortune. Unfortunately for Novak, however, he had been unable to recall the name of the little girl or her father, so he devised a clever plan and moved the carousel back to River Heights. By playing the carousel spookily at night, said Nancy, Novak gained a lot of free publicity for the Wonderland Gallop, which, of course, also helped it make a popular attraction at the amusement park. But his real purpose was to make sure Joy heard that the carousel had returned to River Heights. He was hoping that the news might draw her out to the park for a nostalgic visit. If so, he was sure he would recognize her by her flaming red hair and different colored eyes, especially since he still had the photograph of her as a little girl that Mr. Trent had presented to Ogden at the time. It still stuck up on the wall of the trailer that Novak took over when he brought the carousel. Fingers Malone and Baldy Krebs, however, had spoiled Novak's plan. They, too, were after the horse which Cruz had carved for a different reason. They were the two dark figures seen by Ned and Nancy the night they kept watch in the park. After failing to find what they were looking for that night, they realized that a new lead horse had been mounted on the merry-go-round. So they came to Leo's trailer later on that same night and scared the truth out of him. He knew the two wanted criminals were highly dangerous, so he told them the whole story of how the horse had been bought by Joy's father. But the next day, Nancy went on, when they saw Detective Norris from St. Louis hunting them at the park, they jumped to the conclusion that Leo Novak had betrayed them to the police. So they beat him up as a warning and gave him a black eye. When Joy came to the park, they trailed her home and returned that night to break into the Trent house, but failed to find the horse. Novak, guessing what they would do, had vengefully tipped off the police, but Fingers and Baldy managed to escape capture. If you'll excuse me for a moment, Nancy, Rick Jason cut in, you still haven't told us why these two crooks, Fingers Malone and Baldy Krebs, were after Joy's horse. Nancy smiled, just coming to that. The reason goes back 20 years to a time when Fingers was first being hunted by the law. He was hiding out in that same St. Louis amusement park where the Wonderland Gallop was situated, working as a carny, but he couldn't resist picking pockets. He even persuaded one of the young park employees to help him on occasion. Detective Norris said he was arrested the other day. The St. Louis officer nodded, then told the, the history of Fingers Malone, beginning with a prominent local jeweler who had been robbed at the park. The loot was a small parcel of diamonds which he had just received from New York that afternoon. Fingers Malone was nabbed soon afterward, but the diamonds were never recovered. In fact, said Nancy, the insurance company that Mr. Arno Franz works for has been trying to trace those diamonds ever since. Do you know what happened to them? Rick Jason inquired keenly. Nancy smiled and nodded. I think so. Fingers knew he might soon be arrested, so he entrusted the diamonds to his friend, Walter Cruz. You mean a famous artist helped this pickpocket hide his loot? Remember, Cruz wasn't a famous artist yet at that time, Nancy pointed out. As a matter of fact, he was quite a rough-and-ready, happy-go-lucky type, an ex-cowboy and cattle wrestler who didn't give a hoot for the law. Mind you, I'm not saying he knew the parcel's I'm not saying that he knew the parcel Fingers gave him contained stolen goods. He simply didn't ask any questions and agreed to keep the jewels. Soon afterward, Nancy continued, an art dealer came, an art dealer saw some of Cruz's work and invited him to come to New York and pursue his career. As an impish joke, Cruz decided to hide the diamonds inside the carousel horse, which he had just about finished carving for his girlfriend's father. By then, Fingers had been arrested and placed on trial. Cruz, however, managed to get word to him through a confidential letter smuggled to him in the courtroom by a friend. As a result, Nancy concluded, 
Fingers went looking for the loot when he broke out of prison 20 years later. And I've been trailing him ever since, said Arno Franz. But if Fingers received Cruz's letter, why couldn't he and Baldy find the diamonds in the horse last night? Because, Nancy replied with a twinkling glance at Joy, they didn't know what John Trent that John Trent had already found the diamonds when he remounted the horse on a stand of his own design. What? Joy looked astounded. But Nancy, Daddy never said a word to me about finding any such thing. No, I think he kept them as a surprise for you, Joy, along with another surprise. End of chapter 19. Let's catch up. Gallopant? I don't know what that is. If Ned is six foot, them dudes in the doorway must be huge. It was a children's comic strip. Gallant was all proper and good. Goofus was an idiot who did everything wrong. Oh, okay. Unless he also curled up like a potato bug as he fell. I have no clue what that animal is in Dutch. Armadillo beetle? Uh, roly-poly? I don't know what else you call him. Mr. Franz, did this just become Bob, Bog, Bob Berger? Fingers Malone and the Body Part and Name Gang. <laughs> His fancy burger song. Kneecap Chap, Leggy Peggy, and of course, Harry Larry. <laughs> Ned curled up like a what is that? Piss a bed. <laughs> that sounds like he had an accident in his sleep. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Ned is a six foot creepy armadillo crawler. Fingers and Baldy, the hoodlums. <laughs> Baldy crabs. I think it's Krebs. K. R-E-B-S. Welcome home. You got a package from her interactive. What is, what'd you get? And our friends? What'd you get? You got a package from her interactive too? Did you uh, win a stream thing? Clasps and claps. Thank you. I said it the right way. That might also make him curl. <laughs> I know what I said. I got another physical copy during the sale because I'm trying to build by- Okay, good, good, good. Did you win a contest, Riddy, and that's how you got a package? We have one more chapter. To go. Oh, yes! I think you told me this. But congrats! I hope it's awesome. I think I can only buy one more from her and then I'll have to go back to Amazon and eBay. Gotcha. I never win. Oh, okay. Hopefully it's something great. I'm sure it is if it's from your friend. It's super cool, but I didn't think I'd ever get one because they're expensive. It's That's true. That's so awesome that you got one. Is it soft? Is it nice and soft? Is it like a decent size? <clears throat> I never go to the streams anymore either. I sometimes pop in, but I only stay for like 10 minutes. It was a code word win. Got it. It covers the whole bed. Nice. That's reason enough to, to go back to the streams, honestly. Because <laughs> those are super cool blankets. Okay, let's jump into this last, uh, this last chapter here. <clears throat> find out what Joy's dad would, did with these diamonds. It's the first dream you went back to. That's awesome. Okay. Chapter 20. Picture story. Another surprise? Joy gave Nancy a bewildered stare and giggled nervously. I'd say there have been enough surprises already to... Oh, wait. She broke off eagerly. Does this one have something to do with that drawing we found tucked in the statuette in Daddy's study? Good guess, Joy. Do you have that with you? Yes, of course. With trembling fingers, Joy fished the crumpled piece of tissue paper out of her bag and handed it to the teenage sleuth. 
Nancy showed the drawing to her audience, all of whom were listening and watching with intense fascination as she unraveled the, the tangled mystery. As you see, it's a drawing of a frog on a horse. For a long time, I couldn't imagine what it might mean until I suddenly realized there is a frog on every horse. In fact, there's four of them. Four frogs on every horse? Police Chief McGinnis scratched his balding head. You'll have to explain that to the rest of us who aren't expert riders like you, Nancy. Nancy grinned and explained. The tough, spongy part in the center of a horse's foot, I mean the part enclosed by a hard hoof, that's called the frog. Nancy gestured toward the carousel horse. Since Glory is a lead horse rather than a jumper, he has three feet on the ground and only one upraised. So I'm sure that Mr. Trent's sketch of a frog on a horse was intended to draw Joy's attention to this one particular foot. Nancy's brow puckered slightly. In Glory's case, of course, his whole foot and leg are made of wood, so... No, wait a minute. An excited look came over Nancy's face as she pressed hard on the bottom of the horse's upraised hoof. The frog on this ho the frog on this foot is not wood. It feels more like rubber. She broke off long enough to get a nail file from her shoulder bag, then returned to her examination of Glory's foot. The glossy paint made it appear that the horseshoe, hoof, and frog were all made of wood. But when Nancy ran the point of her nail file around the inside curve of the horseshoe and began to gouge and pry as deeply as she could, it gradually became apparent that the frog had been crafted separately from the rest of the foot. At last, after minutes of effort, she succeeded in pulling the frog out of the rest of Glory's foot like a cork out of a bottle. Joy gasped in excitement. His foot's hollow! Right. Nancy probed inside with her fingers and extracted a tightly rolled brown paper package. When unrolled, it proved to contain a handful of small glittering gems wrapped in several sheets of letter paper that bore a man's handwriting. These stones, Nancy went on, turning them over to Police Chief McGinnis and Arno Franz, are of course the diamonds that Fingers Malone stole at the park in St. Louis 20 years ago, and these sheets of paper are a letter to Joy from her father. Silence settled over the room as Joy read the letter. Her eyes were misting as she handed the sheets to Nancy one by one. The first page began. Joy, dear, this is the hardest letter I have ever had to write. For years, I could never decide whether or not to tell you the truth about your mother and the unhappy early days of our marriage. Now I have decided to leave it up to fate. I have devised a riddle involving your mother's name, Iris. If you are interested enough and really determined to solve the riddle in order to find out more about her, you may eventually discover this letter. If not, perhaps it is just as well that you never learn the sad truth about our past. As I say, I leave the outcome up to fate. After reading the entire letter, Nancy turned to Joy. Shall I tell the others what your father says? The red-headed heiress blinked and nodded, unable to speak because of her tearful emotion. Nancy explained to the others that John Trent's wife, Iris, had come from a wealthy family in the Midwest, who strongly opposed her marriage to the poor working-class machinist from a blue-collar background. Nevertheless, the two were so deeply in love that Iris had eloped with him. As a result, she became estranged from her parents. At first, the two newlyweds were very happy. Bleed ripple TP crunchy roll. Nancy went on. But after their baby was born, Iris became gravely ill. The one chance to save her life was by an expensive operation that would cost thousands of dollars, far more than John Trent could raise or borrow, so reluctantly he was forced to turn to her parents for help. They agreed to pay for her medical care, but only if he promised to get out of her life forever. That shows what you mean. That shows what you mean, hard-hearted people they were. Joy's Aunt Selma blurted angrily. It seems so to us now, Nancy said with a sigh. But no doubt they too were very unhappy over their daughter's plight. Anyhow, John finally and sadly agreed to their demands. But when he left, he took the baby with him and covered his tracks by changing his name from Tobin to Trent. Later, his, wife's, his letter said, he learned that his wife had undergone a series of delicate operations, which saved her life but left her a permanent invalid. During her few remaining months, she had to be kept on a life support system, so she was never able to communicate with her. He was never able to communicate with her even secretly. From that time on, Nancy ended, John Trent suffered bitterly from feelings of guilt, wondering if he had done the right thing. Joy, who was deeply moved by at last learning about her mother, murmured, Oh, how I wish I could have known her. I don't even have a picture of her. Nancy smiled at the girl. Perhaps not, but you do have someone who looks very much like her. Again, Joy stared at the teenage sleuth. I don't understand. What do you mean? 
Instead of replying, Nancy opened the door and beckoned to someone waiting outside. An attractive woman with dark reddish-brown hair walked into the room. This is Mrs. Rose Herod, Nancy announced to the wide-eyed girl. She's your mother's twin sister. Joy uttered a cry of astonishment. Mrs. Herod, who by now had completely recovered from her kidnapping ordeal, came toward her, smiling and with outstretched arms, and gathered her into a fond embrace. Joy, dear, I've been trying so long and so hard to find you. It was a highly emotional moment. Both Rose Herod and Joy were soon weeping tears of happiness. Rose then filled in the missing parts of the story. She too, like her sister Iris, had become estranged from her harsh ar aristocratic parents because they disapproved of her marriage. Rose's husband, then a sergeant but now a major in the U.S. Marine Corps, was currently on sea duty. But seven or eight years ago, while he was stationed in Japan, a friend had sent Rose a magazine clipping in full color with a scribbled notation. Doesn't this little girl look just like you did at her age? The picture, which seemed to have been clipped from some industrial publication or trade journal, showed an unnamed business executive buying a carousel horse for his little daughter. It wasn't until much later, Rose Herod told Joy, that I realized the little girl in the picture must be Iris's child. You see, I was out of touch with my parents and somehow lost touch with your mother, so I never learned the full story of your mother's marriage or how she came to be separated from your father. After Rose's parents died, however, she did learn the full story and decided to trace Iris's lost daughter. Unfortunately, the clipping included no caption and she was unable to find out what magazine it had come from. Then I read in the, new in the paper about the haunted carousel. Rose went on. I saw the name on it, the Wonderland Gallop, and I suddenly realized it was the same merry-go-round shown in the clipping. Accordingly, Rose had come to River Heights and talked to Leo Novak. Novak, prompted by his own greed and suspicious nature, had jumped to the conclusion that she was really after the valuable horse carved by Walter, Walter Cruz. So he deliberately misled her, pretending he had no connection with the carousel at the time the picture was taken. Instead, he had turned over her name and address to Fingers and Baldy. They had kidnapped Mrs. Herod, hoping to extort any clues she might have to the whereabouts of the missing carousel horse. Before this happened, however, Rose had gone to the River Heights Chamber of Commerce and shown them the magazine clipping. They had immediately recognized the man in the picture as the late local machine tool tycoon, John Trent. And thus, finally tracing her dead sister's spouse, Rose had gone over to the Trent house trying to meet Joy, only to be painfully rebuffed by Mrs. Yolly. She had then turned to Nancy for help. But I did so very cautiously, as you know, Nancy, Rose Herod added with a rueful smile. I wasn't sure whose side you might be on. The real choice, I believe, said a man's voice, now lies with Miss Joy Trent herself. All eyes turned to the speaker, a white-haired man who had entered the room quietly behind Mrs. Herod. He was John Trent's lawyer. What exactly do you mean, Mr. Trumbull? Joy asked him. I mean, my dear, do you prefer to place yourself under the care of your father's sister, Mrs. Selma Yolly, or your mother's sister, Mrs. Rose Herod? Now just a minute, Mrs. Yolly cut in shrilly. This child is not mature enough to make such a decision herself. Let me remind you that John's will names me as Joy's guardian. Only temporarily and conditionally, madam, the attorney corrected her. It so happens that my late client, John Trent, left a codicil to his will, which you have never seen. As he spoke, Mr. Trimble extracted a paper from his briefcase and handed it to Mrs. Yolly. As you will see there, he went on, Mr. Trent realized that you and Joy might not get along so well. He also foresaw that if Joy solved the riddle which he left her, she might eventually meet her mother's twin sister. He therefore added the codicil, stating that if this happened, Joy could decide for herself whether you or her other aunt should be her guardian until she comes of age. With a glad cry, Joy rushed into Rose Herod's embrace. Brilliant flashes blazed in the playroom as reporter Rick Jason raised his camera and began snapping photos. For a fleeting moment, Nancy wondered if her next mystery would be ex as exciting as this one. She would know very soon when she accepted the challenge of the enemy match. Her blue eyes twinkled as she fingered... Let's see. Lost my place. Her blue eyes twinkled as she whispered to Ned, Those two crooks, Fingers and Baldy, will still have to stand trial, but I think one case at least has just been settled out of court. End of book. Let's scroll back up. Hi, Rock. How are you doing? Ooh, a pick tonight would be great. It's a conspiracy. Diamonds, yeah. Nin in deception, yeah. Literal minutes of effort. 
Brown paper package tied up in string. These are a few of my favorite things. I have only watched two episodes so far of Stranger Things Rock, um, but I saw myself in episode one and twice in episode two. Thank you so much for those bits, Timon. Would anyone want a jackbox after this? Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Actually, that sounds pretty dang fun. As long as I don't have to... As long as there's nothing, like, going on with my parents, then, you know, if I don't have to step away, I'm happy to do some jackbox with you. Hypo! Oh, dang, I'm number one. Hey, Tom Can, how's it going? He has three whole boxes of cap and Crunch to eat. That's okay, Paige. I'm doing pretty good, Tom. How are you? Nice, Rock. I don't know what this guitar riff's about, but... Apparently it's in Danger by Design. Claps for chapter 20 and whole book. Thank you, thank you. Classos! <laughs> thank you for clapping. I'm doing pretty good. Alright, so we finished this. So, let's compare book to game. Um, completely different. Very different. Joy Trent is the same thing. Like, there is a Joy Trent, but even her part of the mystery is completely different. I mean, it does have to do with her dad and kind of, like, her past that she doesn't know about. But, again, very different. And then, obviously, like, the whole jewels and the, the horse is the same and the haunted carousel is the same. But it seemed they did a lot of deviations for the game off of this book. Um, and I don't know... Why? I guess they're just kind of keeping it, keeping it fresh. But then again, like, I'm okay with the games deviating from the books and just using books as, like, the foundational material um, or, like, idea material. Um, because if you're, like, big into the books, you could play the games and not, like, immediately know, like, what's going to happen and, like, who the bad guy necessarily is. Like, the culprit in The Haunted Carousel doesn't even exist in this book. So, yeah, lots of differences. Good night, time, and have a great one. Thank you for staying here. Please no, um, please no spoilers, Rock. I haven't, I've only watched two episodes, and I would prefer not to be spoiled as to, like, things that are happening, that things that happen later in the series. It needed more Barnacle Blast. The book would be like 700 pages longer of Barnacle How would you even write 700 pages of Barnacle Blast? Alright guys, well I'm going to go ahead and call stream here. Thank you all for being here. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Next book stream um, that we have will be, we'll be diving... Oh, look at that! The green screen... There, you can see the color better now. But um, next book will be uh, The Grim Grotto. So we only have three more books for a series of unfortunate events. And then we'll go back to some Nancy Drews. So um, if uh, Paige is jackboxing, then I'll see you guys there in a few minutes. I'm just going to go check in with my parents and see if they need me for anything. But otherwise, I'll see you guys there in a bit. Have a great rest of the night. Take care of yourselves. As always, much love from me to you. I'll see y'all shortly. Bye.